Welcome to Soul Winners University. We're so glad you can join us tonight. This is our second episode, and we're looking forward to sharing some great ideas and some great principles uh, to help you in your efforts to reach other people. It is ultimately the goal of every Christian believer to reach souls, and tonight we want to help you with that by giving you some great uh, information. And tonight's session will be Steps to Starting a Church. That could be like a new church plant, start a new church. You can call it pretty much whatever you want, but we want to talk to you about that tonight. And we want to start off by saying, before you plant a church, you must first go out and win some people to God. Um, if you're not already actively winning people to God, meaning that you're getting people um, that are lost to be converted, to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and God's filling them with the Holy Ghost, then uh, you're really not winning souls yet. You should never, ever attempt to start a church unless you are actively winning souls. It's a very important, important part of this uh, because how are you ever going to build a church if you're not a soul winner, right? So it's very important to first learn the basics of soul winning and then go out and actually win people to God. And then you want to start planning and uh, you know strategizing how you're going to start your church. The next thing you have to do is you have to overcome fear. Um, I can't tell you tonight how many preachers and uh, people I've talked to uh, over the years that were desperate to start a church. They were feeling the burden to start a church, and they were excited about it. And I would ask them, I would say every single time, I would say, well, why haven't you started one yet? What are you waiting on? That's my favorite question. What are you waiting on? And ultimately, they would tell me, well, you know, I would like to start a church, but, and that word but is always the problem, but I don't have chairs or uh, I don't have money to do this. I don't have the finances to do this. I don't have the music to do it. I don't have teachers. I don't have a building. I don't have this. I don't have that. And they go on and on and telling me all the things that they don't have, and that's why they don't start a church. So I always ask the same exact question to every single person. I say, well, then in other words, you just want to start a church without faith. Because I can tell you right now, after being a church planner myself and uh, seeing the ins and outs of the whole uh, way to do it, I can tell you that you're never going to ever start a church without faith. Faith is an absolute with God. The Bible said without faith, it's impossible to please God. And I really believe that if you start getting closer to God and you can trust him in every way, that you'll be able to start a church plan if you don't have five cents to your name. When we went to Atlanta, um, we started a church with absolutely nothing. We went out on faith. We signed a lease for $3,000 a month for the building. We actually started a church in a building that was very large because I really felt like God was going to help us. When we came to Michigan City, we started a church, and we went and talked to the guy who happened to be a Muslim man. And uh, I was, at this time, going through a, a period of regrowing in my walk with God, and I wasn't really sure if it was God's will to start a church, so I put the fleece out there before God. And I somehow ended up in front of a church, uh, or in front of a storefront, and I pulled up to the guy, and I started talking to him about renting this you know, facility uh, for a church, and he was a Muslim man. And I didn't have any money really to do it. I just had faith that God was going to make a way where there is no way. And after a few minutes of conversation, he told me how much they wanted for the building. I think it was twelve or fourteen hundred dollars. Plus, they wanted a first month, last month, and security. So it was going to basically be almost five thousand dollars or six thousand dollars in order to even open up the church to start the way. And I said to the man, I said, "Listen, I said I know Allah is your God and Jesus is my God." And I grabbed him by the hand. And I said, "Sir, let's just pray right now." And I was bold about it. I said, in the name of Jesus, if it's your will, God, that there's a church right here at this property, I want you to speak to this brother right now in the name of Jesus. I want you to tender his heart. I want you to open every single door. And I believe it's in your will. We'll say it's done. I turned around and I said, thank you to the man. And I said, when you change your mind, give me a call. I left that place and didn't know what was going to happen, but I do know God is able. Amen. And so I waited uh, for approximately two weeks, and I, I always pray in the morning in the shower, and I talk to God in my private time, and 
Uh, I remember this particular morning, I was a little bit frustrated because it's been two weeks. I hadn't heard from the man. I didn't really know what God wanted us to do. And I remember uh, telling God, if I don't hear anything today, Lord, I'll know it's not your will. And I no more than said that. Uh, I started opening the shower curtain to step in, and uh, my phone buzzed. It was a message from the man. And he said, I'll accept your offer. You can start. I offered him only $800 a month. I'm sorry, I left that part out. I offered him $800 a month, and I said, I have no money to start. And I said, I'll get the first month free, and then I'll give you the $800 a month uh, starting the next with no security, no other money. And uh, I remember him texting me and saying, I'll accept your offer. So we knew it was God's perfect will. We didn't have anything, but God still made a way. We didn't have pews. We didn't have chairs. And I remember going uh, and praying and saying, Lord, we need a place for these people to sit at. And I remember uh, finding a, a thing on Facebook Marketplace where someone had some pews available. So I called them up and I went and visited their church. And I said, hey, I'd like to purchase these pews from you and, uh, and chairs. And um, the people said, you know what? After I loaded everything up, I got ready to give them the money. And they said, you know what? We're just going to bless you with these. You don't have to owe us anything. And God made a way where we had chairs and a couple pews to be able to sit on and start the church. Then we needed a pulpit. We didn't have a pulpit or anything to place in the church. And I remember calling a guy over in Ohio. He was from the Assemblies of God Church. And he showed me some pictures of the pulpit. And I saved up a little bit of money to go buy it. And when we got to Ohio, we started talking to him about the work of God and uh, I started to hand him the money for the pulpit to buy it and he said you know what sir he said we're going to give this to your church and he said we believe that God's going to do a great work I'm telling you today that this has happened over and over and over again you can trust God especially if you're reaching the lost and you're winning souls and that's the biggest part of the kingdom so once we have these fears out of the way I'm telling you, do not try to attempt to start a church with fear. The Bible said God has not given you the spirit of fear. He gave you courage and, and he gave you faith to believe that no matter if you can't even imagine it, it's still going to happen because it's the will of God that the churches are started. I really think that church planning is the key to the end time revival of reaching this world. I don't think it's in mega churches and I'm not downing those. I'm just saying that the more we uh, spread apart and the more we go out and uh, to different places, areas and city in the cities and uh, neighborhoods and we plant churches. I don't care if there's five or six churches in Michigan City, Indiana here today in LaPorte County, there should be 50 God-fearing apostolic churches that are planted throughout the area. It doesn't matter if they're five feet from me or five doors from me. It's not going to affect me. You know why? Because I believe in reaching the lost. And there's so many lost people in our city, and it's just like that in your city, that there's not enough churches, there's not even a possibility of enough churches to be able to handle all the people. It's not my kingdom, it's not your kingdom. Come on, it's his kingdom. And when we work for the get together for the good of the kingdom of God, listen, we're not going to be fighting each other. We're not going to be disappointing each other. We're going to need each other, like it says in the book of Luke, when they reached out and they caught so many fish that the nets began to break. And they said that they had to beckon unto their brothers for help. That's what the enemy's tried to do. He's tried to divide us as a people because he knows if we ever get together, I can feel God right now. If we ever get together as a people, amen, and we stop fighting and stop all this fussing, that we can reach so many more people. The potential is so large and so great. And that's why I believe that we need to have more church plants. Send some people out. Let them go and let them start reaching people and building another church in your area. So I want to give you some great ideas and some great advice on starting your own church. We must have faith, first of all, as we talked about. And if you have faith, God will do the rest. The next thing you want to do is you really want to pray. You want to seek God. You want to fast. You want to say, Lord, uh, if you want a church here, give us this field. Open up this area and begin to ask God and seek God. You will drive around and pray about your city, this area that you're wanting to plant a church in. Ask God to help you. You may not hear from God directly, uh, an audible voice saying that's the place, 
But as long as you feel this burden and you feel like that you maybe possibly could reach some people in that area, it works different from every person. I've heard ministers tell me they never even heard a word from God, but they just knew that there was such a hunger in that area that they had to do something. And I'm telling you today that there's a hunger in every area in your country, in this whole nation. There's, there's areas everywhere that we could go out and reach people. So pray and ask God <clears throat> to give you a field. And then a find a location. Location is very important. You want to try to find a location that is hurting, that's broken, that's uh, that a lot of people are hurting and going through rough times. You don't want to try to plan a church or plan a brand new daughter work in a million dollar neighborhood. And I really believe that's one of the uh, issues that we face today is that so many churches want to move their churches out of areas because they say they're so dangerous or they say they're so evil and they're so dark over in this area. We want to get our church on the highway where everybody can see us and we want to put our million dollar facilities up. That does nothing except for appease uh, people that want to sit in the pews and want to be have a country club. If you really want to work from God and listen closely, if you really want to plant a church in the right area, plant it where the people are hungry, the people are hurting. And we keep on talking about these areas as if they're so bad and so dark. But listen to this. What would happen if the churches didn't leave those areas because of the darkness? What would happen if the churches didn't be afraid and, and say, well, they're too dangerous now. we got to move our church. Because what happens is when you move the light out, it becomes darker. That's exactly what's going to happen in every situation. So darkness needs the light. That's what we are. We're the light of Jesus. Amen. If we put our light into these places, it's going to change. Just like when we went to Atlanta, I remember the prophet told me, he said, Tim, you're going to go to a very dark area. You're going to go to a place that's trodden down and it's terrible. He said, but when you leave there, it's going to be bright lights and it's going to be beauty. And God's going to change the ashes to glory. Amen. And that's exactly what happened because we were, weren't afraid. We called the police department, the mayor's office. We said, tell us the most dangerous location in the city of Atlanta. And that's exactly where we went to plant that church. We never had one incident where we were afraid or we felt like we were in danger. You know, we felt the love of God and God has us. He protects us. He keeps us. Amen. And if you go to the places where God wants you to go, find a place that's dark, a place that's in need of a church. Amen. The next thing is come up with a name for your church. And this is very important when you're starting a church plan or a church, uh, new church. It's very important that you don't use a religious type of name like uh, 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 maybe an organization or a, a movement. Don't call your church Baptist or Pentecostal or the Catholic or uh, Methodist. Uh, find up some kind of generic name that you can use where people that are not whatever you're saying you are would feel welcome to come. One of the problems we have is that for some reason someone came up with the idea that we're going to call ourselves Pentecostals and we put that on every one of our signs. And we really don't understand what that does. It only attracts Pentecostals. Someone driving down the street, they may be a, uh, just a hurting soul or whatever, and they see the Pentecostal sign. They're not stopping at your church saying, oh, I think I'll go to that church that's Pentecostal. No, because they never even heard of Pentecost. They never even heard of anything other than what grandma was, a Baptist or a Methodist or whatever she was. So we actually drive people away by putting the, the titles on our church uh, billboards and our, our advertisements, things like that. So if you keep it real simple and you keep it just generic, that's why we call our church the Hope Center. How can you go wrong with hope, right? Uh, and it, it actually invites people who are of different denominations or different types of beliefs to come and try it out. And once they get into your church, that's when they experience Pentecost, right? That's when they experience the power of God and something that they've never felt ever in their life. I can't tell you how many people walk into our church every single week. And the first thing they do before they leave is they say, wow, we felt something in this place that we've never felt before. We didn't have to have the word Pentecost on our sign. We didn't advertise Pentecost. What we did was we demonstrated Pentecost when they walked through the door of our church. Amen. And they were able to actually experience what we're trying to let them know about. So it's super important that whatever you name your church, try to keep it from any kind of titles, things like that. The next thing you want to do is you want to print up 5,000 church cards. 
We recommend a card just like this. It's a, a four by six card. It's full color, two-sided, and you can get these things uh, printed up. You can send me a message. I can help you with it. Uh, Denise Cole, and if you look anywhere in my comments, uh, we'll have her information again. She's the greatest graphics artist, the most humble, wonderful person you'll ever meet or talk to. She's incredible, and she does it very inexpensively. She can design your church logo. She can put together some kind of card like this for you, and it'll be a beautiful. And then you can have 5,000 of these printed up for like around 175 bucks or something delivered to your house, maybe 200 now. <clears throat> but... You can't go wrong. There's 5,000 of these. We actually call these seeds. And the more seeds you sow, the more response you're going to have. If you sow bountifully, you'll, re you'll reap bountifully. Uh, these are highly recommended. If you notice on this card, the back of it says the perfect church for imperfect people. You can steal that. You can have it. That's where I got it. Amen. Uh, the, on the other side is huge. What the name of our church is, Hope Center. On the bottom here, we don't have any religious stuff. We don't have any scriptures. We don't have anything other than, that, hey, this is the place for you. Tells your service time. So these are very important. This is what I would do if I'm starting a brand new church. I'm going to order 5,000 cards because everywhere I go, I'm going to be handing these out and telling people about the new church that's starting up in the city. The next thing you want to do is you want to go out on Facebook and you want to start inviting people to your church. You want to start talking about, hey, we're getting ready to start this new church. It's going to be at such and such address. You want to talk to people about it. You want to send messages out to people who are local in the area and tell them about the new church that's starting up. And then you want to go out and get a baptistry tank. I recommend that if you're just starting out, you can go purchase like a, one of those black, um, I'm not sure the name of them, but any farm and fleet type store. They have like a black hard plastic tubs that are probably around six foot long and about four or three and a half, four feet tall. Get those things. You can put them anywhere. You can fill them up with water. You can drain the water. Uh, it's very simple. You can purchase a little uh, pump that would pump the water out in a hose, something like that. But you're going to need a baptistry. We believe in baptism in the name of Jesus. We also believe that you can get, uh, to start your new church, just a small sound system. You can buy portable sound systems from somewhere like Guitar Center or even online. You can look and find them. And you can find just a portable system to start your new church uh, for around 300 400 bucks. <clears throat> Some of them even come with microphones and the whole setup, and it would be just enough to get you started that you can play music, you can preach, and you can play a keyboard or something like that through that sound system and it work perfect. The next thing you're going to need is church chairs. Um, these are probably the most expensive thing you'll purchase. One of the ideas that we had uh, a long time ago was that if you want to uh, have church chairs, you can simply just ask everybody to purchase one chair. If you go to Walmart, they have the black uh, folding chairs uh, that for $10, 11 a piece. You can ask every person that comes and visits your church, even don't be ashamed or act, shy to ask them. Say, hey, would you be willing to donate $11 for one chair that we can buy and that we can keep filling this place up? Or if you can check with other churches in around the area, sometimes they'll help you by supporting you and giving you some free chairs. The next thing you're going to need is a computer <coughs> and a screen projector or a large TV, because you want to project your um, words to your songs so that the people, the brand new people coming to God can learn these new songs and they can learn to worship along with you. It's really important to have something like that. It's pretty inexpensive, even if you had to take the TV off your wall at home, take it to the church and leave it there, you'll get way more use out of it and people enjoy being able to see the words on the screen. The next thing is very important. If you're taking notes, or we're going to leave all these notes in the uh, comment section after we're done tonight. But uh, the next thing was super important is what time to have your service. If you uh, look at any church in your area, almost every single church is going to have a 10 o'clock service and some of them have a 6 p.m. service. Um, I really believe that that's the biggest failure in our movement. I think that every church ought to have a 2 or 3 o'clock service and the reason why is because when you're reaching sinners, sinners don't uh, get up real early in the morning on the weekend. They've been out partying all weekend. They've been out partying. Even if they didn't party, they only have one uh, day a week off from work, and they're not getting up at 8 o'clock in the morning to get ready to come to church at 10 o'clock. It's very difficult to get brand new people to start coming to church early in the morning, unless they're in the military. 
so if you have a two o'clock service, you can also um, get people from to have their own church. One of the things that I say often uh, when I'm out trying to get people to come to church, I'll be driving the church bus or something, even on Sunday, and I'll pull up next to someone walking down the street or something. I'll say, hey, want to come to church with me today? Three o'clock service. They'll say, oh, no, you know what? I've already been to church today. So I say, hey, that's great. Have you ever missed church one time in your life? And certainly they'll say yes. And I'll say, well, guess what? We have a three o'clock service today, so you can go twice to make up for that time you missed. And it works all the time. I mean, people just say, oh, they'll laugh about it. And they'll say, okay, I think I can come. <clears throat> but if they have church service the same time we do, if we all have 10 o'clock service, there's no possible way that they're going to come from another type of church and come to your church to check it out. So three o'clock or two o'clock service is an absolute, in my opinion. Try to find musicians. Uh, live music's always the best. You say, well, man, Pastor Tim, I don't know how I can do that. I don't know if I can afford it. You'll be able to afford it. You just do it on faith and God's going to make it happen. But you do need music and music helps, especially if you have good singing and things like that. But you can go on Facebook and you can just put a message out there for the community. Does anybody play keyboard? It can help our church. Does anybody play the drums? And you'll be shocked at how many people would show up and start playing music for you. It may cost you a little bit of money. I'm really against paying people, but when there's no option, you just do what you got to do to make it happen. Amen. The next thing you schedule your first service. You want to start planning for it. You want to start advertising for it. You want to start telling everybody, hey, let's say uh, December 15th, we're going to start this new Hope Center. And we want to let you know it's located at, let's say, 1247 East Michigan Boulevard, Michigan City, Indiana. It starts at 3 o'clock. Invite your friends, your family. It's going to be off the chain amazing. You don't want to miss it. Advertise it big. Make it exciting. And people will start to come when you start to schedule your service. Then you want to hit the area with door hangers and cards, inviting people. Sometimes you can even start out your first service by having a blessing to community service, giving away a couple bicycles or some gas cards or Walmart cards or something. You say, well, I don't know if I should give away stuff to get people to come to church. By all means, do something. You know, uh, it's not going to hurt you to give away something. Even if they come for the wrong reason, they're still going to come and hear the word of God and the word of God will be with them forever. That word might change somebody's life, and you'll be able to reach them easier when you have a little something to get them to come. What, what, one thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to have a church service and nobody show up. Amen. So you're preaching to yourself or your family, and that would be a shame because people are so hungry and they will come, especially if you pass out some kind of uh, door hangers. You can buy door hangers like by the thousands, real cheap. You could print up something that you're having a special service and go put them all over the apartment complexes, uh, all over uh, trailer parks, somewhere where you have a lot of places in one area. And you can get those out there and people are going to come and show up at your service. The next thing, having the church uh, guest cards for when people arrive to your first service. It's so important to get information, especially emails, name, address, phone number, uh, emails, what their email is, and you want to make sure to have all this information stored. We use a program um, called Faith uh, Team, and in that Faith Team, we can add each and every guest that comes. We'll have the guest card filled out. We'll put that information in there, and the Faith Team has a deal where they actually uh, can text out uh, people by mass text with only, with only showing up with one text uh, per person. So, for instance, if we have 20 first-time guests, we put their information in there. And then on Sunday before 3 o'clock service, usually around noon, we'll put a text out. And we'll say, hey, don't forget we got church today at the Hope Center. 3 o'clock, you don't want to miss it. It's going to be awesome. We click send, and it goes out to all the people who are on our text list. And it reminds them that church is going to happen. Because you got to remember, these are babies in Christ. Sometimes they just need a little reminder. They need a little nudge. When you do have your first church service, you want to make sure it's really high pace, it's fast, and it's anointing, and it flows with, with God. You don't want to have a boring service. Do something. Uh, whatever you got to do to make it exciting. Amen? Pray. Get God's uh, focus in your life and make sure you have something to present to the people where they want to come back. 
Uh, we're getting close to running out of time already, so I'm going to hurry. Ask God for a special anointing and an outpouring of the Holy Ghost in your services. And work towards that and really preach with all your heart and let people feel the passion that you have and the love you have for their soul. Have an altar call uh, with repentance and baptism first. And then after the altar call service, again, ask for people to be filled with the Holy Ghost. It's very important when you do your altar calls. You don't just say, well... You know, we're thankful you're here today, and if you really want to make a move for God, please walk forward and come up to the altar today. God can help you. Never do that. People are not going to get be the first one most of the time. But if you say, hey, if this is the end of the service here today, and before we close the service, I would like for everybody to stand. I'd like for every single person from the front to the back to make your way up to the front of this area here so we can talk to you before you go home. And then that, that's so uh, easy for them to accept that versus saying, hey, come to the altar. <clears throat> These are brand new people, so you want to make it comfortable for them. And then once they're at the altar, every single person would come. Then you simply give the altar call by asking them, hey, how many of you would like to go to heaven? They raise their hand. How many would like to go to hell? Nobody, hopefully, raised their hand. And then just tell them, John 3 and 5 says, except you're born again of the water and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Acts 2.38, Peter said him to repent. So before we go today, we're going to all repent. To repent, you have to actually talk to God. You have to ask him to forgive you. You have to speak to God. And you don't just think your prayers like this. That's called thinking and you want to. The Bible said you have not because you ask not. Talk to them about uh, repenting of their sins and teach them how to do that. And then go through that. And then at the next thing, say, hey, if you've never been baptized, we have water available in our baptism. What would stop you from being baptized today? Is there anybody who would like to be baptized today in Jesus' name? Okay? Go through that process. You're ready for a great service. You're ready for people to be born again. And then the next thing you're going to do after you have this first service, you're going to want to start following up on all the people. You want to start <clears throat> going through those guest cards, getting their information. Maybe go do a home visit. Take them a little small gift. Call them on the phone, uh, text them, email them, whatever you got to do. Stay in contact with them and begin to let them know that your next service is coming up soon. The next thing you want to do is you want to go win souls every day. The Bible said that the Lord added daily to the church. The reason why God doesn't add daily to your church is because you probably don't go out daily to get them. But if you'll make an appointment every day to go out and reach somebody, Pretty much every day you're going to see someone born again of the water and spirit. Go win souls daily. Serve the poor. Go find people that you can serve. <clears throat> we started out uh, by handing out uh, McDonald's sandwiches. Back when they had the dollar meal, we'd just go spend 20 bucks and give them out to the poor. And the Bible said, he that giveth unto the poor shall not lack. So God's going to bless your efforts. People are going to start coming. You're going to have an incredible time. Uh, don't try to make these people Pentecostal. That's so important. Give them time to grow. Let God make them who they're going to be. Amen. Um, don't preach uh, all these standards and tell people, hey, you got to change or make them start wearing a certain clothing or do things like that. Let God speak all that to them. You teach them how to love Jesus and you teach them how to fall in love with God and he's going to teach them how to live right. Amen. But whatever you do, if you want to have a terrible church and you want your church to never grow, Preach to them standards and tell them all that stuff and just tell them that they're going to hell, whatever. But if you want to see your church grow and give them time to grow with God and you see a healthy church, just begin to teach them about loving people and loving God. And God's going to do all the rest for you. It takes an average of five years for a fruit tree to bear fruit. It's going to take these people five years or more before they ever bear fruit. So you have to be patient with them. You have to love them. You have to give them an opportunity to be able to grow with God. Never get disappointed when you lose someone. Every harvest has a winnowing process where God separates the wheat from the chaff. And as you're reaching more and more people, you're going to see more and more people stay and more and more people go. Uh, someone said, well, bless God, what, what good is it to go baptize all those people if uh, a lot of them don't stay? Well, there's churches that baptize one person a year and that person doesn't stay. It's just all about numbers. The more people you reach, the more people you bring in, the more people are going to stay with you and God. 
keep going and doing it. Start a church as soon as you can. The more churches that we have out there to start it and plan in churches, the more people we're going to see come to the kingdom of God. And that's what this is all about. So Winners University, we love you and thank you for your time tonight. We remind you again, we do have a book called Understanding Soul Winning. If you'd like to purchase this, just send me a message. We'll get one out to you right away. There's $6 uh, or $15 for the book, $6 for your uh, shipping and handling. We'll get those out to you right away. If you'd like to support the Hope Center and the work we're doing here in Michigan City, give me a message. We'd love to have your support. It always helps us in the long run. Until next week, we love you, and God bless you, and go win souls.